Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation about optimizing business solutions with Azure Full Stack products. So today, Mateus and I are going to be talking about how we implemented products developments and uh, all the way down to production in Azure with product delivery over there and uh, talking a little bit about the challenges that we faced, how we got there, how we started the whole thing, and hopefully you guys can take something away from it as well. So let's get started. So this is the agenda. Uh, we are a business uh, built in Brazil, part of LexNexus Risk Solutions here. And uh, we're going to talk about how it all started over here, the local project that we have, the technology stack that we do use, uh, the architecture, design decisions and challenges. Those are going to be the meat and potatoes of the presentation, things we went through, decisions we had to make that hopefully can uh, apply to you as well or give you an insight on when you have to do your own decisions. And we're going to close it off with a product demo real quick one just to show what we actually did build here. So who we are and how did we get here? This is the timeline. I'm going to be talking about two, two of them. Uh, top one is about Quad, which is our, our client here in Brazil. Uh, basically, the it's a credit bureau that's composed of the five biggest banks in Brazil. They got together to build this company and they need a technical partner. That's where LexNexus with the HPC systems comes in. And uh, the bottom line, uh, the blue one, is going to be about our local business here, which we call Project Santo Dumont internally, or short, uh, we call it PSD. And we're going to be going over a little bit uh, the different things that happened since we started this. So back in 2017, we uh, had this business and then we went after an office, which is this picture you can see, the team back then. And uh, this is basically just a crude office before we started the build out, which again happened in 2017. Back then we were just doing a lot of team building, interviewing and training so that we could build a team that would do this. Uh, since then, and since 2018, all the way through today, actually, we have uh, a group of people back then uh, led by Hugo Watanuki who were going to the prison to schools, uh, universities, and uh, different companies in Brazil to spread the HPCC word. Uh, at that point, we're doing uh, workshops, uh, seminars, and even classes being uh, given thought in uh, those universities. So that's how we, something we're very proud of, how we're going to be, how we are, have been spreading the HPCC word here and uh, how all the fruits that that bared for us, which I'm going to be talking about here as well. In 2019, we actually delivered uh, the first few products to this customer credit related products alongside uh, an API and a web portal where the, the customers can consume said products. 2019, I'm sorry, 20, 2020, we started building the fraud products and also we started a, a support phase. That means we handed over the development of new products for them and we were just uh, in the background, just giving support whenever needed. And that's when we started our own uh, business here in Brazil when we started the cloud, our own cloud journey, right? The idea is to have uh, this from the get-go being cloud native. And that's when we started just slowly transition from our quad clients into building and studying how we're going to do things here in Brazil. Very, very slow at the beginning. Then in 2021, uh, we had two things happen here. Uh, the first, uh, thanks to those efforts that started back in 2018, we had uh, a participant from Brazil an university that uh, joined this very same conference that we have here and uh, on, on the poster competition and he won uh, on the research category. So we're very proud of that. And also in 2021, we had our first MVPs out from a technology standpoint and also a product one. In 2022, the same thing happened again. We had somebody else from Brazil that uh, joined and uh, won on the Community Choice Award. Also very proud of Natalia here. And we had our our production go live. So we had two products, which we're going to demo in the end, being released through three different delivery channels. Uh, that is the API from an ESP part. We're going to be going into all those details, web portal, and also on a batch mode. And also very important in 2022, uh, we straightened the bond with Quad. So Lexus made an investment in the company. So Lexus now owns a part of uh, quad, which uh, states you know how far our relationship is going to go, uh, how how strong it's going, and it's going to continue to go. And this is making just our day to days even closer together. Now on the PSD again, PSD project since the moment the project that we built here in Brazil, that's going to be our focus now. All that I said before was just how we got here. So this is going to be our focus, and uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about how it was going from developing things on prem 
chill on cloud, right? And through that, we go through some paradigm shifts, how we did things over there and how we're doing things now. So first thing, Azure regions, there's multiple Azure regions you can choose from, and you have to consider things like the resources that are available in each one of them. It's not always the same. The price for those resources uh, vary over region as well. And anything like latency that you may uh, have depending on where you're going to serve your products, right? So all these different things that you need to consider. Ownership of infrastructure. Back then on-prem, we had a specific team uh, responsible to you know, acquire, rack, and install, configure all of our uh, servers and applications. And now on a uh, cloud, it's actually all done by uh, your provider, right? In the case of Azure or Microsoft. And the teams actually have to build the code, right? So th these items go together, the zero touch part. So everything that we build or pu put on the cloud is infrastructure as code, IAC. And it's all done programmatically through Terraform scripts. And the teams that actually build it, they maintain it and they own it, right? And uh, because it's important that it's all uh, easy to be able to replicate and that's it's not going to change, it needs to be zero touch, right? Which means we don't go in a specific server and change a config or anything like that. We treat them, the servers as kettles instead of pets that we did on-prem, right? Well, what, what means here is we don't patch a server. We don't make config changes. We just destroy it and instantiate a new one, right? So it's, that's why it's important to build my code and that we can easily replicate and instantiate a new one just like that when we need it. Another consideration here is the redundancy part. Um, like I said, you can have uh, multiple regions in Azure and there's multiple ways of having said redundancy, right? You can have it cold, warm, uh, hot, and you can do that in the same region or in the same availability zone or in a different country altogether. So all different things that you have to consider when, you, when you're comparing for having uh, two data centers, physical data centers. From a development standpoint, Automation and standardization, these are items that, for instance, when you want to just run automatic builds and deploys, these are things that are uh, using GitHub Actions, for instance, right? So everything in between all teams needs to be standardized so that we can do it all on the same fashion. We created here what we call a technical requirements committee, and that's a short uh, TRC, uh, how we call it for short. And uh, that's basically a team that we rotate every time uh, of technical small group that interacts with the product group when we have a new demand and a new initiative, as we call it, so that we can help them digest those business requirements that they have into technical requirements that we can easily share with the different engineering teams in order not to involve like 40 plus engineers in one specific meeting. That's how we're doing things here. Uh, and uh, it's been very fruitful for us. Finally, very good practice to have, Cloud Committee of Excellence, uh, CCOE for short. Uh, the company has this is basically some architects and engineers you get together and uh, define uh, a lot of things on how we're going to be doing our cloud journey, cloud migration, for instance, decide on uh, how the artifacts, what are the artifacts they're going to be needing, uh, the procedures that we have to go through, how one thing is going to be done versus the other or providers that we're going to be using, right? So this is very good so that they know basically and standardize everything that's happening across the big company when we're talking about cloud migration. Finally, security. Uh, we are very concerned about security all the time, but when we're talking about our data, our customers' data being in the cloud, for instance, in the public cloud, right, which doesn't mean it's publicly available, but it's outside of our premises, our security uh, standards go even higher, right? So this this goes all the way back to how we designed the solution, for instance, uh, as we call it, uh, shift security left. And uh, part of that is about the secure software development lifecycle or SSDLC. Basically, uh, it, it's a standard definition of uh, different phases that we go through. A lot of them include way before actual development so that we can uh, make sure we have all the artifacts, all the playing done before, all the security folks involved as well so that we can define exactly what we're gonna be doing, how we're gonna be doing and making sure that solution is rock solid. So to make a project uh, like ours run, there's a lot of gears that need to be behind it, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about them and then Mateo is going to go through the details. But first, we have, uh, for instance, File Exchanger. That's how we receive our data from our vendors. Databases, uh, not to store our data. Our data is stored on Tor. I'm going to talk about later. But just to have any in intermediate state or any inquiry data, for, some, for instance. Uh, on the back end, we have file mover, file tracker. So basically tools that we do to move files around between the uh, the SFTP zone, for instance, into Thor and the tracker to make sure we know at, at exactly which stage each file is uh, in our pipeline. 
Thor does the actual data processing, the ETL. Uh, Roxy, the product delivery, that's where the products are. And uh, we have also authentication authorization. Uh, this is a centralized service from LexNexus that we just consume. And in the front end, we have the GUIs for our internal systems as well as the three delivery channels I already mentioned, a batch, ESP API, and web portal. And in addition to all that, we have artifactories, monitoring, and other third-party tools and software that are also going to be touching here. So having said that, Matheus is going to take on the next slide to present you the architecture. Thank you very much, Mauricio. And hello, community. Now that you heard uh, about the story of Project Santos Dumont in Brazil, and we saw a beautiful abstraction of how it looks like, let's dive a little bit and explore it in a high-level architecture view. From right to left, actually following the direction of the requests that come from our customers, we can find third-party services of operational related purpose and also a service later to be detailed, interfacing to end customers and being the entry point for our delivery channels, Mauricio already mentioned. Then on center, we have a representation of the Azure layer where mostly all the pieces of this puzzle run, including the three already mentioned delivery channels, web portal, ESP API and batch. Finally, Express Route is the piece that connects uh, all this back to our on-premises site. This is where our engineers connect from, and this is where all our systems were running before we started this whole migration journey a couple of years ago. Expanding this high-level perspective, we can start from a, a perspective that runs behind the scenes, but it supports it all, which is operations. As the height of the security bar got raised, provisioning the infrastructure of the project using code became a fundamental piece to pursue a zero-touch operational model. In the past, infrastructure used to be seen by many developers as someone else's problem, and with the cloud migration journey, F developer in Brazil was encouraged to get the hands dirty in the best sense of the expression and write telephone code, which despite of being maintained and revealed by a few SREs, it's a light thing and subject to shared responsibility. The change in this mindset also was an opportunity to implement CD in the project. In a few scenario like in the case of the, those life cycles, uh, less, more permissive and less critical, for instance, dev and known prod, we really have CD standing for continuous deployment. However, in production life cycles where uh, the environment is more restrictive, uh, when in um, change management policies in place and the CD terms stands better for continuous deliver. This means that in practice, artifacts get automatically made available and become ready to be deployed at the press of a few buttons. This also means that the chances of human errors get significantly reduced by having, for instance, automated builds like Docker containers and Helm package builds, automated flows for, uh, flows for promoting these artifacts between the three life cycles with all the approval requested remembering the three life cycles are dev, non-prod, and prod, and also supply chain tools with embedded scanning features. Keeping apart operations for a while, let's simulate the user, user journey. In order to do that, it seems fair to start from the entry point of PSD delivery channels, which is Cloudflare. Cloudflare is a well-known company who provides variety of services. We could use also Azure services as an entry point and Azure application gate is one example of a great possibility. But Cloudflare honestly offers so many facilities that it becomes hard to build it. Cloudflare is capable, for instance, of granting us DNS resolution with a bring your own IP possibility which is pretty interesting because it gives us more liberty to migrate from one vendor to the other in case we need without having to let our customers know about the new IPs and making them have to update their uh, IP restriction rules that might exist, for instance. Also, 
Uh, it's capable of granting us revert proxying with load balancing capabilities, deny of service protections, web application firewall, and content delivery network speeding a, a lot the delivery of static assets such as bundles of web applications, for instance. When the customers hit uh, the endpoints of the delivery channels, Cloudflare forwards the traffic back to Azure. And almost most of the applications or systems that run right there are served with Kubernetes. Uh, it seems now to be fair to take a look at it. Azure Kubernetes Service, AKS, is where the majority of the teams run, including the fundamental pieces of the three existing delivery channels already mentioned. But why AKS? Uh, an immediate thought could make us believe that just lift and shifting applications up to Azure with virtual machines could be easier and maybe more cost friendly. And that was possibly true. However, if we think about the possibility of sharing the same underlying resources of the cluster by many different applications, horizontally out scaling them uh, and these applications will have a variety of demand over time for sure, then this difference becomes questionable. And then the other advantages of platform as a service get highlighted, like the easiness of building due to the smaller amount of stuff to set up or tune, if any, easiness of maintaining because the responsibility gets uh, shared with the vendor and also easiness for scaling, of scaling with streamlined deployments getting facilitated through horizontal pod to scaling. All this support uh, faster time to market, which has been demonstrated to be a fundamental thing for a business like ours in Brazil. A few recommendations right here are prefer deploying immutable and version container images that contain everything they need to run the applications, but the configurations that can be dynamically injected as environment variables or secrets. Also prefer a vault for storing the secrets whenever it's possible. Apply the chains with assistance of Helm Shard for standardization reasons. Apply serve smashing with mutual to TLS between the pods for security reasons. Apply uh, network security policies also for security reasons uh, to determine who each pod can talk to both for inbound and outbound traffic. And finally, prefer uh, pulling the images from uh, container registry like Azure Container Registry right close to the AKS where the applications run for faster pooling and pod recreation instead of pulling these images from another registry or artifactory somewhere else. Before moving to the applications that run inside the AKS cluster we just saw, let's explore first a bit of the database layer that several of these applications on AKS connect to. When MySQL was running on premises with all the applications on Azure and the beginning of the project was following that, um, that description, um, the applications used to go through the database uh, to express route connecting down to the database. And we experienced network delays and more variance in the query execution times. Migrating database to Azure provided a significant smaller uh, latency and average response times with less variance. In certain scenario, performance improvements reached five times, which is pretty considerable. There were different possibilities of provisioning these MySQL instances on Azure for sure. Two of the alternatives have, uh, that have been considered were first running MySQL on virtual machines, thus an infrastructure as a service approach, and two, uh, running MySQL using platform as a service approach, which in this case is Azure Flexible Server. Possible drawbacks of opting for MySQL Flexible Server could have been, for instance, the limitation of privilege that the, the service can, can grant us actually like the super privilege 
uh, the limitation of the being joint supported because this Azure service only supports InnoDB and memory uh, engine DB, DB engine in read-only system schemas, for instance. However, all the drawbacks and limitations were acceptable for Brazil. And actually, met, we met the Brazilian requirements with the banner being capable while being capable of bringing all the benefits of PAS. Uh, so the decision at the end of the day was to opt by MySQL flexible server with built-in high availability and zone redundancy. Instead of having uh, a redundant replication of this database running on a DR location 24 seven, important point to mention, Basically, duplicating the cost, having Azure redundant backups, uh, and just replicating the backups to a cold DR demonstrated to be very cost effective and still capable of meeting our recovery times and recovery point objectives. The service on Azure comes with SSL connections enforced, uh, which in an infrastructure as a service approach, we could have this flexibility of deciding if that, that was something desired or not. However, it is indeed desired in our project. So it was a pro actually of this uh, approach. And the Terraform source code and stage management for the database and the applications have been separated to minimize the chances of side effects to the database infrastructure being caused by change on the source code where the developers maintain everything else. Um, another reason to do that was that it becomes easier to segregate the access of the maintainers to these uh, environments, both inside a GitHub while maintaining the source code and uh, inside Terraform Enterprise while uh, running the plans, applying the changes and controlling the environment variables. This is highly recommended, by the way. Finally, uh, MySQL can be exposed uh, internally only. That's totally acceptable and actually preferred uh, with no public remote access. The virtual networks of the MySQL and the AKS can be peered. Uh, so pods running on AKS can see uh, the database host through a private DNS, for instance, and it can establish the connection successfully. Now diving into the applications that run inside AKS, let's focus on two, the two more important pieces uh, that are the web portal and the ESP. Starting from the web portal, which is a delivery channel, like already mentioned, uh, it's split in two different services, a single page web application that is cached on the CDN of two layers actually, it's cached on CDNs of Azure and then on CDNs of Cloudflare as well. And it's fastly delivered to the, to the end customers. So this application starts running on the browser of the end customer. And whenever the end customer interacts to this application running on the browser, under the hood, it just makes a request to a REST API to fetch the dynamic data. And this uh, REST API is a token-based uh, API. So it relies on the token to determine if the, the identity of the user connected and asking for that resources, obviously uh, under the hood taking um, into consideration all the grants that that user has like roles, permissions and stuff like that in an RBAC mechanism. Product Portal also has caching to speed up performance of everything that is possible that's totally recommended and easy to accomplish uh, on Azure. Interacts to other layers uh, is always made by ESP, except by the database that the product portal, the web portal is capable of hitting directly. But it's important to mention that 
the data for the products itself comes always from Roxy through ESP. And the type of data that actually is fetched from the database or inserted into the database is mostly stored st uh, state and transient information, transient story. Now talking about ESP, ESP is at the same time uh, a flexible interface for internal and external purposes. We do have it separated in different deployments. So we do have uh, an external ESP, uh, like we call, for serving the external customers through the API delivery channel. And we do have the internal ESP serving the internal systems, such the web portal we just presented. ESP has also another use case, which is being a gateway to other resources like database. For instance, if Roxy can't reach the database directly, it can reach the database through ESP, for instance, to fetch some information that is hot and uh, has not been ingested yet and does not replicate it to the keys. Um, or for instance, in other scenario, let's suppose that Roxy or any other component inside AKS needs to fetch data from an external API. It can also be done through ESP, have an ESP working as a gateway for that. ESP is the layer responsible for the triple A, which is authentication, authorization, and accounting. Making sure that in the context of product consumption, ESP will always verify if the given consumer has the proper GANs to make that consumption and ensure that it will generate the proper logging for later BIP generating the billing. Important to mention that our version of ESP is built on the HPCC platform image that is wide open for everyone. So all our systems, uh, web services actually are built on top of ESDL. And one great example of contribution for recent contribution from Brazilian team is the addition of support to caching, which speeded it up a lot, improved a lot the performance of our um, web services by the addition of caching support to the HTTP XML uh, and my SQL tags of the SDL. And by the time you are watching this presentation, there is a good chance that this change will be wide open to the community. If not, that's a spoiler, uh, good spoiler of something to come shortly. Now talking about HPCC, um, already talked that uh, ESP and web portal run on AKS and the AKS was the first thing to be migrated to, to Azure. So ESP and the web portal were the first components to be migrated to Azure uh, right before Roxy. At the time Roxy needed to be migrated uh, Roxy was not performing perfectly in AKS. It was a work in progress. So, but it was performing very well in VMs for a long time. And we knew how to size VMs according to the expected capacity. And we got also a pretty good deal with reserves, reserved instances uh, for the VMs on Azure. So the decision of lifting and shifting Roxy to Azure VMs met the requirements of the business and was a better way to go at that point. Now that the other pieces have been migrated and we learned more about AKS as well, this is probably going to be reconsidered. One drawback uh, worth it to be shared of the current setup is the non-triviality of the horizontal scaling of the Roxy cluster. There is Always, uh, there are always two, at least two Roxy uh, nodes behind the load balancer. And once our demand is predictable, it is acceptable to other remove nodes on demand via Terraform. 
but that's not option, uh, optimal because the scaling is not automatic and uh, it also very time consuming because of the copy of the data that gets required. This means that there is obviously lots of space for evolution in a jointly effort with the platform community. In order to keep costs under control, the scheduled shutdowns of deployment and non-production clusters uh, can happen off hours or on the weekends and are a good suggestion as well of an opportunity to save good money. Let's talk about Tor. Uh, Tor is the last piece yet to be migrated to Azure. It's running on premises because of mostly two reasons. Number one, uh, prioritization reason, because we prioritize first all the layers from the customer, following the customer uh, journey, let's say. And number two, a financial reason, because we have much data and plenty of hardware available on premises to take advantage of at virtually no cost because the hardware the harder was already there. So it was also a financial decision and mainly a financial decision. This is the next system on the queue to be migrated and we can anticipate the challenge to be very similar to the, to the ones we, we saw for Roxy migration. Let's go deeper in this and highlight um, a few points on this diagram. Uh, so basically all requests to Roxy um, are intermediated by ESP, like already said, which reads Roxy through a load balancer. If Roxy needs to fetch data um, from any source other than the keys, it can be done um, through a gateway, which is an ESP service that can, for instance, connect to the database for having access to hot information. We can actually also mention an exception for my last statement of always reading Roxy through the load balancer with the batch delivery channel that hits Roxy directly, but that's because of the high volume required actually is pretty fair in, in this uh, in this scenario. Um, other highlights right here could be that secure traffic uh, is all over because of the security protocol being applied all over the place. Segregation of different subnets for proxy and AKS, for instance, enable connectivity, but enhance possibilities of establishing network security policies to determine exactly uh, which system can talk to Roxy and vice versa. Outbound traffic, if required, is always established via a proxy. Logs are ingested into log analytics workspace by an agent installed on the VMs. And these logs are made available to dashboards on Azure Monitor to be later considered. Inside the Roxy clusters, uh, Roxy's use larger VM size when compared to Dali and Sasha ones. Uh, for instance, we use standard D4s V4 for Roxy's and standard B2s for Sasha and Dali uh, for costing reasons. And the authentication is always established using LDAP. Tor is already mentioned to run on premises where hardware is available at additionally almost known cost. And finally, but super important, plenty of GitHub actions assist the operationals, uh, such as query publishing, all tied to review process, obviously. That's pretty much it. Uh, thank you, everyone. And back to you, Mauricio. All right, continue here and uh, diving deeper on the logging side. We have, as been mentioned, Azure Log Analytics Workspace. It's been proving to be a good centralized logging location for us. I know uh, it can be easily integrated. We have uh, support from AKS standpoint, 
from the containers and also the agents on VMs. So everything we need can be easily shipped there so that we, for our consideration. One important thing though, is that we have to keep attention to standardizations. So make sure that we're all, you know, always logging sort of the same thing between the different components or, or useful information in the same sense and that we are careful regarding verbosity, right? So it, it can be very easy to just log as much as possible and then have one trouble uh, accessing what is actually trivial and important over there but also from a cost perspective, right? Uh, it can get pretty expensive. So the chart that you do see here is our cost breakdown. On the log analytics side, you see that it represents currently 21% of our monthly costs is going through, through log analytics. That's, that's, that's a pretty hefty amount considering that for the actual processing that we have on, on VMs and AKS, it's on 26%, right? So there's definitely some work that we plan on keep doing here to make this uh, repository better and be able to analyze just the actual very important information. So we, we do have some work to do here, but just to give you an idea of uh, how, the, how this can grow and uh, what is the current percentage of a reward project. Now from the monitoring side, going back up there on, on the third party uh, side of the diagram that we see, we have implemented outside monitoring, which means that we have an application that mimics the user journey. So basically it proactively uh, goes into specific endpoints that we created for monitoring from the authentication side, as well as the product, so that we can see if uh, we can be notified and alerted if a given threshold is met of like it, it being down and uh, we are immediately notified if something's off so that we can go in and check if it's an actual thing, an actual problem with the product being down so that we can quickly uh, have a good turnaround of people and just make sure we understand what happened and fix it as, as soon as possible, right? And uh, we also have dashboards. Uh, so this is basically, I have a few pictures here to show the dashboards that we can from a more proactively approach, go in there and verify uh, live in, in a given specific period that we may want to understand what's going on on an overall health of our solution, right? So for instance, here we can see the average execution time specifically for, I have, we have removed any specific actual data because it's not relevant just to show what we actually, the insight we want to take. So we can see what the ESP time versus the query Roxy time takes. We can see the average execution time per method that we have. So this is our two products, IVS and ID for score. Uh, in blue, which I'm going to be showing a little, in a little bit. So we can see uh, here that uh, IVS usually takes a little bit longer. Uh, total requests per method. Again, uh, you can see here that this was a period that we had much more requests on IVS, so much it overshadows ID for the score. And uh, this all gives us a good understanding of what's going on, right? And this is the request uh, per response status code. So all the different uh, options for response that I can have, we can understand if, if we see all of a sudden a spike in a specific error code, for instance, we know something may be off and we want to jump in. Or even coordinate with the client, with the customer, right? Like what, what's going on? Maybe the input is wrong and actually give proactive support. So quick recap here, uh, a few challenges along the road that we overcame. Uh, this is going to tie uh, everything together from what uh, I should just showed in Matteo's show before me. These are the rocks that we had to uh, climb through. Cloud learning curve uh, all the way back to 2022. Uh, it wasn't as spread as it is today, especially within uh, our uh, business unit here. So there was a lot of learning to do, lack of actual content or people with the knowledge, the SREs, the uh, reliability engineers. So we had a lot of uh, self-learning, self-teaching to do, uh, but it, it made us stronger to get to where we are today. Uh, the redundancy part as well, like I said, there's like with the way we do it uh, with the warm infrastructure, for instance, it can be considered for multiple instances. You have to consider what it is that you want to achieve and put that in the balance regarding the risk and also the cost that it may have you, right? So there's different situations that may require high availability. Some may not, depending on your SLAs, for instance, and you want to strike the balance just right so that you don't overpay and uh, you make sure your customer is still happy. Monitoring, uh, just talking about this, right? So it's very important that we have this uh, constant eyes on the solution so that we can tell what's wrong, where can we improve and uh, just quickly go in and remediate if anything happens. 
component migration, right? Different components may require different strategies, uh, different efforts, different costs. And uh, this all has to, be, has to be considered depending on what it is that you're trying to do and uh, what are your end requirements and to see all the different op uh, options that you have from a cloud resource perspective. Cost control, you know, uh, the idea that we have from, from uh, in, in Brazil side here is to start small and go scaling and increasing as needed. So it's very easy to just go in there and max out everything and then pay so much you never make a profit, right? So, or log so much, it, it costs uh, you way more than you make just to log that transaction, for instance, right? And so this is something you always have to keep in mind, Sh shutting down lesser environments when you don't need, like Mateo said. So these are all different things that you have to keep in mind when you're talking about the cloud migration. HPC scaling has been covered as well. I know having VMs or horizontal capabilities limited, it's still possible, but it, it has some uh, difficulties in between. And uh, I know when we do migrate to VMs, it's probably gonna be, hopefully gonna be better, right? Uh, hybrid call latency, as Mateo said, we started way back with everything uh, on prem and slowly migrating all the components. And in between, we had communication through Express route back and forth, right? And this made it so some transactions that had to be authenticated, for instance, all the time, or had to hit a database specifically, uh, ha went through this back and forth that added to the latency of the overall transaction. And uh, we made efforts to reduce that, for instance, like you said, and showed migrating databases from on prem to cloud. Uh, reduce this greatly. So this is something you have to keep in mind when you do choose the hybrid cloud approach. And finally, resource sizing, right? Uh, you need to make sure you get what is needed, especially if you can't tell what's going to be your demand or have a good idea so that you can, for instance, go with reserved instances where you can pay a lot less and have that for a longer period, right? But that's important that you have some uh, previsibility in the future, know where, what you're going to be needing, and then you can select that beforehand. Now for some of the challenges still to come, I actually just mentioned Roxy and Tor VMs to BKS, right? As soon as possible, we wanna do that change so that we can uh, have the whole thing uh, with AKS rather than VMs as much as possible. That will probably, that will definitely make our lives easier with full automation uh, from data releases, uh, testing, and and the, the proper side of scaling. and enhancing our capability, having that fully automated, reducing as much as possible the manual interventions that we have to make. And on the centralized monitoring, right? We already have that on, on us, the, but the more we can have there with only the actual needed parts, right? Only the bits that we actually need, but having more information from our components, only the essential parts and that we can extract exactly what we need. That's the end goal that we still have in mind so that we can also reduce the cost and still increase our observability. All right, so let's show a little bit of the products that we built here. Now we're gonna start off with the identity verification solution, the IVS. Uh, this is a product where you put in information on the entity you're trying to verify, and then it's gonna tell you how, the likelihood of that being the actual person that you have, right? So this is what a page looks like. We have the different inputs here, input fields that you can uh, choose. On the right side I'm showing you, you can select the different input combinations. There's plenty, and it's gonna highlight in the fields, right? So this, we have the CPF, which is the equivalent in Brazil for social security number. Give the person name, their mother name, uh, and phone number, for instance, as well. And then uh, you can select how complete of an answer you want, like the simple version, intermediary, and a complete, and that just basically means the amount of data that's going to be echoed back to you. So here you can see a score on the likelihood of that person being who they say they, is, uh, they are. So this is being verified and the information down below. Now moving on to fraud score, similar inputs uh, configuration here. You can select simplify or complete version if you want or not a cached response from the past in case you've searched this person before and you hit search, it's going to show you a, a score of the likelihood of them being involved with fraud. And then the reason codes down below, which is basically the most relevant attributes that were considered in giving you the set score for that person, right? So that's what we have for the demo. Now let's move on to the end. So basically, uh, this is it. Thank you very much 
for uh, attending here with us. Um, this has been this presentation of Matheus and I, and uh, if there's been any questions, hopefully we had the opportunity to answer in the chat. If not, please do reach us out in, uh, in our, through our emails or other channels, and then we can uh, reply to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.